come. Now is the time to worship. I like that now. Come now is the time. Meaning, don't put it off. Don't wait till tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And don't count what you did yesterday. Oh, I worshiped this. Come, now is the time to worship. Mm -hmm. see, now puts you in the proper perspective because now is the only time that you have any control over you and anything about you. Right now. What you do right now is what counts in the rest of your life. You see, because yesterday is gone. You can't call it back. Tomorrow has not come yet, so you don't know what's going to happen. But right now, and I love it when it says, come as you are. You see, some people get caught up in this thing that, you know, I can't go right now because I'm not ready. I have to get ready. I have to prepare. I have to get myself together. No, you don't. Come just as you are. You see, that's what he wants you to do. Come as you are so that he can clean you up. See, because when you think that you're clean, then you don't think that you need cleaning up. So therefore, all of those things that you're holding on to will remain because you won't let him sweep them away. You know, well, I cleaned that up and I got it. No, come now just as you are to worship. Come now just as you are. Don't wait. Tomorrow is not promised and yesterday is gone. Now is the time to worship. Come just as you are to worship. Come just as you are before your God. That is powerful stuff and it gives us a platform as I said you see if we count on what we know to clean ourselves up we're going to stay dirty for the rest of our lives Why? because we have a sinful nature everything in here is sinful everything in here is sinful it has got to come from there he is the only true God who is sin free you don't have it you can't make it. It is not yours to possess. He has to impart his righteousness to you because you have none of your own. So come as you are. Come as you are. And now is the time. Now is the time. I, I can't say that hard or fast enough, but now is the time. Now is the time. Read your newspaper yesterday. Somebody was on their way somewhere and had a head-on collision and they never made it to their destination. Maybe they said, well, when I get back home, I'm going to pray. If they'd have prayed before they left, think of the advantages. Now is the time. This is the only time that you have any control. It's now. Now. So come on, just as you are. You don't have to clean up. You don't even have to take a bath if you don't want to. Just show up. He, he'll straighten you out. He'll straighten you out. So don't worry about, well, if I'll get myself in a little better shape and I'll wait till I know now. See, and then you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. He will fix it. Come just as you are before your God. And again, I want to stay on that theme because I want to go this morning to the book of John and, and read to you from John 4. And it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. And I'd like to take a, a minute here to stop my reading and to give you a little history so that the, the word will be a little more interesting to you. You see, Samaria was like New York. It, it, it's an, a region and a city with the same name. So if you say Samaria, it doesn't mean it's the city, it means it's the region, it's like the state. 
And the Jews hated the Samaritans, so they would not go into Samaria. So in their travel, as Jesus is about to do, go from Judea to Galilee, the Jews would go across the Jordan River and go around Samaria and then come back across the river once they got past it and go into Galilee. The straight route to Galilee was three and a half days. So you see, they would spend another couple of days just to get around it so they didn't have to go through it, so that they, they didn't have to associate or to be in contact with those people. Now, the, those people, they, they hated them not because of anything that they had done. It is because of the intermarriages with the Gentiles that took place in Samaria. And that took place because when Syria, Assyria was ruling that territory, when they went out and did a raid and they captured people, and brought them back, they would weed them out. They would take all of the smart, pretty, all of the ones who had something to offer, and they'd work in the palace or in the higher echelon. And then the rest of them, they were just cast off into that Samaria area. That's where they stood them. And love happened, and they would get married, and ta da. So the children of those intermarriages were not pure, so the Jews didn't want to take any chances by associating with them because of who they were. They were the people, God's chosen people. And so they hated the Samaritans, Samaritans, and so therefore they would go around that area it's just not even to go in there fooling with those people. Now in Samaria there was a city called Sychar, and Sychar was the modern name of the city, but the old name of the city was Shechem. That was in the Old Testament, Shechem. So the reason we're here is because Jesus, again, is leaving Judah to go to Galilee, and he says that he must go through Samaria. <coughs> And that's how we come to where we are. That Jesus is going to Samaria. And Jesus is going to Samaria is to avoid a conflict with the followers of John the Baptist. Not John the Baptist himself, but the followers of John the Baptist. Because they are jealous because, again, of the baptisms. Jesus is baptizing more people than John. And John come up with this baptism. John is the one that was baptizing. So they were jealous, and so they were starting a problem. So Jesus decided to just leave for a while because baptism is not high on Jesus' list of priorities. He, he is more concerned with the saving of souls. Remember, he come to save the world from their sin, to save the people from their sin. So he's not really concerned with baptism. So he's on his way to Judea. So that that just gives you a little, little insight as, as we go. Then cometh, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the partial of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. See, that's why I gave you that little sack car thing, so that we could get past the part where you say to me, oh, well, preacher, Jacob and Joseph, they wasn't around when Jesus came. No, it was Shechem when Jacob dug the well and gave it to Joseph. But now it's sack car. So there's Jesus sitting in Samaria on a well in Sychar at high noon of the sixth hour. He's sitting on the well at high noon. And we continue. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. 
for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy food. Then said the woman of Samaria unto Jesus, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For you Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you to give me a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, you don't even have anything to draw water with. And this well is deep. So where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his camels, cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drank of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drank of the water that I should give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him mm -hmm. shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Mm -hmm. The woman said, Sir, give me this water that you're talking about, that I thirst not anymore, neither do I have to come here and draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, You have said well, you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one that you have now is not your husband. So in this you said truly. Mm -hmm. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now watch her change the subject. She don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she says, our fathers worshipped in the mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't even know. We know what we worship. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour come, is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah come, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I am he that speaks to you. I am he that speaks to you. This woman came to the well at noon, at high noon, when there would be nobody else around. She came to the well at high noon because the other women drew their water in the mornings and in the evenings. She came at noon when everybody would be occupied because she was an undesirable. She was not fit to draw water with the other women who were upstanding women in the community. But God I say but God because yeah. the woman was not fit to draw water with the upstanding women of the community. But God, the woman could have not been fit to draw water with anybody in the city or with anybody in the state or with anybody in that nation but God. You see, this was this woman's day. This was her day. You see, there are a lot of days that are, are, are New Year's Day, Christmas Day, your birthday, Mother's Day, Easter Day, all of these days we have. But this day was this woman's day. 
It was her that she didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about because she was at the well and water was the topic. So she knew what she was talking about when she was talking about the water. You see, Jesus was talking about the spirit and holiness and the woman continued to talk about the topic at hand, which was water. You see, because she was not one of his. And I'm saying that even though she was not fit to draw water with the women of the community, Jesus yes. said she was fit mm -hmm. for him to communicate with. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about when you're feeling unfit, you think you got God. It doesn't matter what the community thinks about yes. you. Yes. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about you. God. He's got it. God's got it. You see, he cared enough to come to Samaria. He said before he left Judea, I must needs go through Samaria. So the question is, why? Why? But the answer is clear. The answer is clear. He must needs to go through Samaria because it was this woman's day. It was her time. You see, we all have a day. Yes. We all have a day. Some of us have had our day, and some of you, your day is to come. And it doesn't make any difference where you meet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any difference where you meet. You will be there, or we were there, doing whatever we were doing because that was where we were supposed to be. And you see, Jesus said the same thing about us and will say the same thing about you who haven't had your day is he must go through your city. And it doesn't matter what you're doing because I come to Mark this morning to tell you that nothing just happened. Yes. Nothing just happened. This woman was ostracized so that she would come to the well every day at noon because everybody else was eating lunch at that time. So there was no chance of her running into anybody. So she came at noon to get her water. Everybody else had their water and they would come this evening and get their water for the night. But she came at noon because nobody else could be there. This is God. So you see, it doesn't make any difference what you're doing when your day come, God will show up. He will show up. You remember Moses? Moses was herding sheep and goat up the side of a mountain. And God showed up to, hey Moses, come here. Saul, who we know as Paul, on his way to Damascus to persecute some more Christians. Jesus showed up and said, Hey, Saul, where are you headed? And our girl, our girl shows up at the well to draw water when there's no one else around because she's too bad to be around people. But you see, God has something for each one of us, and we are never too bad for him. Amen. He will make the trip. You see, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. So when everybody else has thrown you away for no good and you are useless to them, God has some value in you because there is something that each one of these people had. Amen. So what do you have? What do you have? It doesn't matter what you have because when he shows up, he will equip you to do whatever it is that he chooses for you to do. Amen. This is the God that we talk about. This is the Jesus that we are serving. The Jesus who says that we are his prized possession. So you see, what the world says don't really matter. It is what he says about you. And he came to give his life a ransom for yours. Meaning to purchase you out of the sin and destruction that we find ourselves in. I'm talking about the value that he puts upon you, not the value that you put upon you. Because we are quick to say, I say, oh, I'm just no good for nothing. I can't do it. I, I. But God says that you are worth everything to him. 
So he drops what he's doing to come wherever you are. And you will have your day. And when you have your day, you see, it is not important what you're doing because he will give you what you need to do. And you're there doing whatever it is you're doing because he knew that that's where you would be and that's why he showed up there. The woman just didn't happen at the well. She was primed to go to the well. So when he showed up at noon and sat on the well, he knew she was coming. She had no clue. But Jesus was there. And he said to her, give me a drink. You, worthless, no good woman who nobody else will associate with, give me a drink. And she said, what's the matter with this guy? He's a Jew. Don't you know who I am? I'm a woman of Samaria. I'm a woman of Samaria. And you asking me for a drink? I thought you guys would rather, rather drink urine than to drink a drink of water from a Samaritan. <laughs> that was that was the perception. They do anything rather than they won't even walk through that side through that street. So you know there was a deep hatred. There was something that just said that they were nothing, no good. And here is a man sitting there who she recognized as a Jew said, "Give me a drink." She's astonished, and the conversation begins. But you see when. God shows up. When God shows up, it is not important what you're doing. It is not important where you are, you see, because he transcends time and space. Yes. Wherever you are, worship is available. Yes. Wherever you are, worship is available about anything, anytime. This is the God that we're talking about. He comes to seek and to save that which is lost. So you see, you can be anywhere doing anything and it doesn't matter. What is important is how you handle his visit. What do you do with his visit when he shows up? Do you accept or do you reject? That is the important part. And he will equip you to handle anything that he sets for you out for you to do. You see, because we all have something. We all have something. But it takes him to bring it out. When we rely on him, it is called that surrender. When we give ourselves to him, then he can bring what is in us out. So when we accept him, then we can move forward. We, we talked about Moses. You see, when Moses accepted him, what did he do? He sent him back to a place that he was running from to bring the rest of the people out of. Now here's Moses in charge of a million people. A man who was running from the place that he went back to. He didn't think he was ever going to go back there because he didn't think he was worth it. Not only that, he thought that if he ever went back that he would be killed because he had murdered a man before he left there. You understand what we're saying? Moses had killed a man and ran away. And now he's in the wilderness. And God said, come here. And Paul, as we said, he was on his way to persecute Christians. And, and Jesus said, where are you headed, Paul? Follow me. I'm saying that we all have something. It doesn't make any difference where we go. I'm reminded of the rich young ruler. And this is the importance of accepting and rejecting, you see. Recognizing your visit and taking advantage of it. You see, the rich young ruler, he didn't wait for Jesus to come and find him. He sought him out. He went and found Jesus. 
And watch what he said. Listen to his words, and you can see where he is in his walk. He said to Jesus, hey, good teacher, what good thing must I do that I can inherit eternal life? What good thing can I do that I might inherit eternal life? Now, you don't see this in the pages, but when you read it, you hear exactly what he's saying. Give me something to do so I can get eternal life so I don't have to fool with the rest of you. I don't, you know, I don't want to be bothered with you. I don't want to follow you. I don't want to listen to you. I don't even want to be around you. You tell me what I need to do to get eternal life, and then I can be on my way. That, that is what he's saying. And Jesus responds to him with an attitude like that. Jesus responds to him instead of just saying, like a fly, it's a swatting boy. <laughs> Jesus says, do you know the commandments? Mm -hmm. He said, which one? <laughs> and Jesus gave him the five that you can see. He said, you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not lie, you should not murder. No, that's, that's kill. <laughs> you should not commit adultery. <laughs> and Honor your father and your mother. He gave him the five that you can clearly see. And the guy says, oh, that ain't nothing, man. I, I've done them ever since I was a kid. What else you got? What do I like now? Jesus hit him with something that he couldn't see. He hit him with the ones he couldn't see. He said, well, go and sell all of your stuff and give the money to the poor and then follow me. Now, see, some of us thought the same thing that he probably thought when he first heard those words. Jesus wants the man poor. Wants him to sell all of his stuff and give his money to the poor. He wants him poor. Now Jesus don't want him poor. Jesus don't want nobody poor. That's just not it. Jesus wanted him to see that he was not doing the commandments. Jesus wanted him to see that he was missing. He was satisfied with what he was doing. But when Jesus gave him those, he went back to, to Mark. Where did he get? Mark 12. He went back to Mark 12, where the lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Mm -hmm. And the one next to that mm -hmm. is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. There is no other commandments greater than these, is what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. And you see, these are the ones that the young man was missing. Jesus said, sell all your stuff mm -hmm. and give the money to the poor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Help your neighbor out. Give him a little something. Don't be selfish. Don't keep it all. Don't do it. And come and follow me. Love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul. Come and follow. And it says that the young man became sad. He became sad and he went away sorrowful because he had missed it. He had missed it. So what do you got? What have you got that you can't give up? I can follow you if you can give me some things to do, but don't ask me to stop doing what I'm doing. Don't ask me to give up what I got to follow you. It is how you accept his visit. Do you receive or reject his visit? This is what God is asking us this morning. When you come seeking him, you have a motive. Mm -hmm. When he shows up and gets you off guard, you just got your heart. You just got your heart. I'm looking for Jesus. Everybody that's looking for Jesus is looking mm -hmm. in the wrong places. That Jesus is within. Mm -hmm. He's within. 
told us that way back. Gave it to Jeremiah, as a matter of fact, to give to us. He says, I have placed my laws and my statutes in their hearts and written them on their minds so that they all will know me from the least to the greatest. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last forever. Amen. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and then the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we got to behold his mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. When we are immersed in the word, that's when we flow with God. So what have you got this morning? Whatever you have, God can use it for his purpose. Amen. God can use it for his purpose. Amen. And he will meet you wherever you are. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to try to find He will meet you wherever you are. And he's waiting. The Bible says that he stands at the door and knock. And if you will just open the door, he will come in and fellowship with you. Amen. So you see, wherever you are, God will be there. God will be there.